Hey, um, my name is Jessica Williams. I am actually um, a coworker of Dr. Coggins. I am the fifth through eighth grade teacher at the school that she currently teaches at. Um, my name is Jessica Williams. And um, before I start, I wanted to give a little bit of background because I am a baby scholar of Dabrowski. So from a professional standpoint, I have a bachelor's in elementary education um, with a focus on special education because Kansas State University had gotten rid of gifted at that point, but I've always been really interested in gifted. Um, and then I then went on to get my master's in gifted at Wichita State University and coming soon is my doctorate at DU. Um, I'm studying under Norma, which is phenomenal. She is an amazing mentor. Um, and I am about to start my 14th year of teaching gifted this next year. Like I said before, I am the fifth through eighth grade gifted learning teacher with Dr. Coggin. But before I knew Dabrowski, my life skill was always reading. My compensatory skill for existing was reading in that I found solace and a mentor in characters like Amelia Bedelia. When I was younger, um, my mom told me to um, butter the pan because she was making brownies or something. And she's like, make sure you get the whole pan. And um, she wasn't watching me. And I did the outside and the bottom too. Um, because I was following directions. Um, and I've kind of always stayed that way. But then as I've moved on and gotten older, I've also found solace in authors like Patricia Cornwell, who writes phenomenal, phenomenal medical mysteries. But then as I've read her books, I become obsessed with an author, of course. And then I found out that she just did this side project because she was obsessed with Jack the Ripper. So she wrote a whole book outside of just her like fun research projects she did. Um, so like I said, I am a baby scholar, but before um, I get into my presentation, I feel like you need to understand my essence. And if anybody who has met me knows, when you meet my parents, I make a little bit more sense because I am a character. And so um, I am an amalgamation of characters. Um, these are my parents, Debbie and Will. Um, my mom is psychomotor and intellectual. My mom reads a dictionary for fun. And she is also a ski instructor in her retirement. And my dad, in just retiring, my mom told him to get a hobby. And he is now nationally ranked in pickleball within a year. Um, my sister, um, we are both very competitive young ladies, um, very involved in sports. And I didn't realize how competitive she was until we both went for our masters. And even though she's two years younger than me, she's very competitive and she will never let me live this down. She got her masters four days before mine. So that's kind of where I come from because my family moved from New York to Kansas when I was eight. I've never quite fit in. I've always tried to make sense of myself. And like I told Chris, my whole life has been, why am I the way I am? And the way it's always been explained to me is that I'm a character. And before I knew Dabrowski, that's how I kind of quantified myself. So like most kids, I was a squirrely kid. And that's a picture of me when I was, I think, three. Um, however, the picture on the right is from when I graduated with my bachelor's. I've never quite grown out of it, which isn't bad, but most people couldn't make sense of it. Um, I tried to find work through running and I ended up running over a hundred races. I dabbled in bodybuilding. And then I knew that I was working for, towards my doctorate. And so I read a hundred books in a year. And then my newest challenge in my intellectual, now that I know Dabrowski, because even though I've taught gifted for 13 years, I've only discovered Dabrowski and overexcitabilities when I moved to Colorado two years ago. Um, and I, it, it, it's really helped me make sense of myself beyond just, I'm a character. Um, so my intellectual challenge to myself was as I'm working on my doctorate, um, I wanted to present at a conference like this. So this was my 36th birthday present to myself because Monday was my birthday. Um, and so I applied and somehow I got this presentation, which is, you know, kind of dorky of me to be excited about, but that's where I, where I am. So to get to the meat and bones really is I have been really inspired by kind of odd things. So this right here in the middle is a Reddit post. 
And as a doctoral student, we really work with APA. So I had to learn how to cite a Reddit post. But I, this really just resonated with me. If you ever feel bad about yourself, just remember that if you are a fictional character, people would probably love you for all your flaws and quirks and mannerisms that you probably hate. So just remember that, okay? ILU, which is short for I love you. So this really inspired me. So I pushed outside of the theory and I wanted to make my students comfortable because it is vulnerable to work with overexcitabilities and to work with a theory. So I went to Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance to kind of step away from our own profile first and look at something else. In that cognitive dissonance tells us that when a person's actions and attitudes are discrepant, physiological arousal results leading to psychological discomfort, which in turn motivates the person to restore harmony. So kind of stepping away from yourself. And what I'm suggesting or proposing is that we have guided positive disintegration in the classroom, guided by somebody who knows the theory. Through this, we're gonna help our students have chosen role models that they choose. This isn't their parents choosing, this isn't their teachers choosing, it's them choosing their role models. And as those that have watched the past few days, the kind of theme has been mentors. And like Kelly was asking, what about peers? I feel like characters in books can be their peers sometimes. Um, but with that guided positive disintegration, we also, as teachers, are aware of the possible negative feelings of working through positive disintegration. But we also can work on growth from inner conflict and we can model that. We can show them this is how I work through overexcitabilities and kind of working through a crisis or things like that. So, um, what I suggest is having them be aware of their, I'm sorry, am I covering up the screen for you guys? Is, my, um, is that in doing guided positive disintegration, we um, are, are teaching our students to be proactive rather than reactive. We don't want them just in that primitive biological impulse. And as Katie will tell you, I love you know, kind of being devil's advocate and have students question social convention and have them question, how should I approach a topic? And then um, the other big thing is with this, I think as gifted teachers, we should be helping our students with compensatory skills that are helping them build a toolbox. And this toolbox can be developmental potential that they think about. And they have those role models, they have those morals, those values that they're working on because we want our students to be more conscious clear and determined. And we want them to select the elements on which they place value. So what I want to suggest is having students pick a character from a series or an influential person. This could be a historical person. This could be somebody from a nonfiction book, but try to have the student choose a character that is dealing with a similar life event. And I say life event instead of crises. Um, to have kind of a positive connotation to students. Um, it could be something dealing with their current age. It could be a current identity that they're, you know, working with. It could be a family structure. It could be hobbies. It could be sports. It could be a life event. So the suggestions I always give, there's, there's two book lists that I always go off of. One of them is Project Lit. And Project Lit is out of New York City. And um, there was a teacher in New York City in the public schools that just noticed there weren't a lot of dynamic and diverse protagonists that her students could read. His, could, he, his students, sorry. Um, and so I will tell you from Project Lit, I am an avid reader of YA books and middle school. Um, there is not a single book from this book list that I haven't devoured because of how phenomenal they are. I will tell you that the YA list, there are some controversial topics. So as parents or teachers, I might um, look at the book before I give some of the YA books. The middle school books are very safe. Um, the other book list that I always go to is Leslie Rosling's. Um, and she has a book called Talking Text, but she also has a Facebook page. And the Facebook page, I would highly, highly suggest following because she has book lists that come out I swear to you, every week um, on books that are good for kids whose parents are going through divorce, um, disability. Um, she has um, book lists for students that are dealing with incarcerated parents, or even she had an entire book list for National Dog Day. Um, 
And then she also has a book list for kids that are really interested in STEM. So she has all these math books and science books. So um, I would always suggest looking to Leslie Rosling. So as a community, um, I've really learned that as I teach teachers how to teach, I want them to walk the walk. So in the chat, what I would like you to do is I want you to think of characters that resonate with you from at least each overexcitability. And to give you an idea, these are the characters that resonated with me. Um, for Psychomotor, Jake Peralta for Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Amelia Bedelia, and then Mia Hamm, my soccer kind of um, thing. I also resonate with Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec, Hermione from Harry Potter, and then Condoleezza Rice, who not only is phenomenal in the political world, but she also just bought, bought part of the Broncos. Um, for Imaginational, I um, resonate with Hamlet. Does the ghost exist? How did that really help Hamlet? So this is not just um, literature, but it's books, it's TV, it's movie. Because some of our kids, because of, like you said before, dyslexia or things like that, they aren't diving into every book. So I want you to think of characters that resonate with you um, with emotional, Edgar Allan Poe. I like the dark stuff, Emily Dickinson, and then Meredith Grey, because I'm currently been watching Grey's Anatomy. Um, for sensory, Sandra Cisneros and her phenomenal short story, 14, um, Monk, who notices everything, Frida Kahlo, and then House. So in the chat, I wanna give you about five minutes. I want you to think of one character from each overexcitability that resonates with you, just a part, a piece. And so in the chat, if you could please um, make your personal list, I would love to see where you guys are at. And I will give you until 17. 1117. Sorry, I'm on Vegas time. So. Oh, Jessica Day. Yes, 100%. Oh, Spencer Reed, 100%. <laughs> oh, I don't know Basil Hallward. Oh, I don't know who those are. Okay. Oh, Captain Benson. Oh, okay. Guys, about three more minutes. Try to think of at least one character that resonates with you from books or TV or movies.
Ooh, I like how somebody used one that was two over excitabilities and not just a single one. So that's a great way to push too, is have students think of um, characters that have multiple um, over excitabilities. Tony Stark, 100%. Okay, so as we're having our students walk through this, um, one of the overexcitabilities list that I like is from um, the book that Dr. Freed and Dr. Coggin talked about, that living with intensity is from Piotrowski's um, Forms and Expressions. So I'm gonna put it in the chat so you guys can have a copy. Um, if you guys wanna open that and make a copy, um, that is Forms and Expressions. And this is more of a qualitative list. Um, and like I would tell my students, this is not exhaustive. These are some suggestions. And as I've learned through teaching gifted students, my reality, my perception is my reality. Their reality can be totally different. So I like to use a grounding document. So when you ask your students to do this, you could use this document that is from Piafsky's um, book. Um, and it has actual examples of things like rapid speech, marked excitement, intense physical activity, um, pressure for action. When I think of pressure for action, I think of Leslie Nope. Um, mark competitiveness. And so as we look at this list, I would, instead of having my students think about themselves as overexcitability, I would have them that character that they chose. So what I would like you to do is in this document, and I always wanna make sure that I am helpful in using Google Docs because not everybody uses them. Right here, this highlight color on your copy, if you click, you can pick whatever color makes your heart sing. Um, I want you to think of that character you just chose, and I want you to go through and highlight, like if I were to do Leslie Nope, I could highlight pressure for action, and I could highlight it, let's say blue is my color. Um, but the other cool thing is in this document, as you work on your character, you also can write comments to yourself of um, when the character really did it because she was trying to open that park, if you watch Parks and Rec. Um, so I want you to spend the next five minutes thinking about that character and walk through this list and highlight things that you've noticed about that character that they do. And you can highlight in a color that makes your heart sing. And I want you to also, if you want, write comments that are actual um, evidence from the text. So as we are, as I am always a language arts teacher, um, pulling evidence from the text, and you could have that as students work through a, a different way of looking at characters. So I wanna give you about five minutes as you look at this document, think about that character you just chose and highlight things that you've noticed about them. As you do that, an extra challenge, because of course with gifted, I always wanna give a challenge. Um, I want you to highlight things that you have seen them either do think or say, oh, it's not sharing, boo hiss. Um, darn it, I thought I was gonna share. I'm sorry guys, I thought I was gonna share. Um, I always do this. Okay, um, as you work through this document, I want you to think about not just, this is anybody in my doc, I'm sorry guys. Google Forms is not always my best friend. Um, sorry. Let me put it in the chat again, the document. Um, open that over. Okay, I see lots of people on it. So if you guys can make a copy of this and then um, go through and highlight, I'm gonna give you until 10.25. Um, the challenge of course is maybe highlight something in a different color of possibly misunderstandings of our excitabilities too. Maybe the best friend thinks they actually are this, but really there's something else. So if you could make sure to make a copy as you highlight um, on your document, I will give you until 1025.
Two minute warning, just to guys help some of us with time awareness. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if that was enough time or if maybe you need a few more minutes um, using the signals? I'm gonna take that as you guys are working. So thank you for walking the walk. Um, so using that cognitive dissonance and have them look at worksite abilities through the lens of the character that they have as a mentor, um, we're now going to step back into their own life, their own perspective. And I would now ask you, I'm going to give you another five minutes, um, to think about yourself and think about your overexcitabilities and think about things that you have done, things you have said, or things you have thought, because of course you're the only one privy to your thoughts, unless you're like um, my coworkers who know everything that goes on in my brain. So sorry, Katie. Um, but I want you to think about kind of a global, or you think about your um, positive disintegration that's possibly happening right now. Um, I want you to go through the list in a color that is your overexcitabilities. Now, it may be something that is the same as this character. And I want you to go through and evaluate things that you've noticed about yourself um, and maybe do notes. If you were doing this on paper, I would have my students kind of write margin notes, but since it's online, we're doing those, you could do those comments, you could highlight. So I, wanna, I want you to think about overexcitabilities as a toolbox. So I want students now, and you guys are my students, um, to go through the list and highlight things that you've noticed about yourself. So I'm gonna give you until 31. Um, I want you to go through that list, try to remember which color is which too. Um, I always make myself a key. Um, 
So go through the list and um, highlight things that you've noticed about yourself. Someone is a very loud typer. I'm sorry, I don't know if <laughs> that person knows they're not muted. <laughs> Thank you. Three more minutes. Now, of course, I would give my students more time to do this, but um, one, I feel like I'm rushing and um, I just wanna make sure we get through everything, but I really appreciate, like I said before, we're walking the walk. So now that we have both the kind of analysis of the character through the lens of overexcitability, and I am a former high school language arts teacher, um, if, if we have students that are kind of annoyed with writing notes or things like that, um, if they're more of a math mind, I would just say, this is showing your work. This is showing your thinking on the page. So to me, margin notes are the same as showing your work in math, which some of our gifted students don't like to do either. But um, this is just a really good way to have kind of a, um, kind of a, a thunderstorm of everything that's going on in your brain of a character and then looking at yourself. And I really want this to be a positive activity and not critical and just things you notice, they just are. They're not good, they're not bad, they just are. So now that we have this analysis of a character that resonates with us and then ourselves as a character, 
I want to now think about that guided positive disintegration. And as students think either globally or about the current kind of thing that they're, they're thinking about that's on their mind, maybe it's their parents' divorce, maybe it's transitioning to high school, um, I want them to think about the pieces that they didn't highlight that could be their ideal. And as we walk through and we look, I want us to think about what our ideal could be. And so now I'm gonna ask you to highlight again, um, but I want you to think about what is your ideal. Now with gifted students, I don't want them to think their ideal are things that they aren't. I want their ideal to be things that they are and they can add to. So if your ideal includes, like on mine, um, I always want to be curious. I always want my capacity for just learning to never cease because that has been the driving force in my life. But know that this is, this is asking our students to be very vulnerable. Um, so like um, Daniels and Pihovsky say in Living with Intensity, developmental potential includes sensitivity and capacity to be intensely stimulated and to stay stimulated. So what I would want this to be, this ideal profile, is not a piece of paper that exists, but a living document. And this could be something that the student could work on. Um, for me, it would be lamb. It would be in a sheet protector, maybe in a folder, maybe your profile. So what I would like you to do is I'd like you to look through um, what you've highlighted so far in possibly a new color. Um, and I want you to think of your ideal, either globally or through whatever you're currently going through. And I will give you until 38 um, to think about your ideal. And remember, you already can have parts that are your ideal because you're an amazing human. Oh, I see an amazing little human. Sorry, get distracted. Two more minutes.
So I like to remind my students of all the work that they've done. So, so far you have chosen a character, you have identified characteristics of overexcitabilities in them. And then if you've looked at yourself and you've noticed characteristics of yourself, hopefully you've written some evidence down. And then you've also thought, what's your ideal? I don't want you to think about what your friend's ideal is. I want you to think about yours. And you guys have done an amazing job. So now that we've done all that work, now we get to fly. So what I propose is having students write letters to these characters. Now, characters like Jessica Day, I can just imagine her as an actress would want to respond, um, but Hermione is not gonna be able to write back. So um, what I would like, and, and I'm not gonna ask you guys to do this because I don't think we have enough time, but um, I would ask your students to write a list, to write a letter to this character, telling them about things that they've noticed. Not saying, hey, I know, um, maybe they're on book four of Harry Potter and they're like, hey, you're about to do this. This is what I suggest. I know that saying leviosa is very important, but maybe doing it a little kinder or just giving some suggestions. But as a language arts teacher, um, I would ask them that they include examples of overexcitabilities in both um, their character that they've noticed and also in themselves, kind of giving advice to this character um, because it's not about just being critical of ourselves, but using others as mentors. So in writing this letter, um, I would say maybe a page handwritten, maybe so many words if it's typed, um, but having kind of an expectation of thinking about either globally or a specific event, um, things you've noticed, things you suggest, um, and maybe even asking that character for advice. Hey, this is what's going on in my life. How would you approach this? Um, so the other thing I noticed is a couple of you said Meg from Wrinkle of Time. Since you both wrote to Meg, another extension that you could do is possibly have the other person who wrote to Meg write back in Meg's voice to that letter um, and write to each other using either your lens or Meg's lens. Um, because I think, and I know actually, um, when I think about movies like Divergent, which has our different thinkers or Hunger Games, my perspective of Katniss Everdeen is totally different than somebody else's because I noticed certain things and we may have some similarities, but I think it also would be a really cool exercise to have students write through the lens of those characters too, because they're gonna have to think about not just overexcitabilities, but the voice of the character. So that language arts teacher in me is kind of coming out in that, um, how would they say things? How would they present them? What things would they be open about? What things would they possibly still keep, you know, really close to your heart? So my suggestion is to have students look through overexcitabilities using mentors and peers and characters from books and TVs and movies. Um, like I said, check out Leslie Rosings lists and check out Project Lit. Those are my go-to book lists always. Um, and then I have all of my references and I'm done. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I see a big question. Okay, hold on. Let me look at it. Okay. Could this work be integrated into a student's individualized plan? Could it be used to inform the IPP and address specific areas? Could it be shared as a tool, um, common vocabulary? Could it be integrated with curriculum? Yes, I definitely think this could be integrated with curriculum. The other thing, and, my, and I also taught high school math, so I taught high school calculus. My calculus students will tell you this. They thought that I was getting paid by Hidden Figures when it came out, because I was like, guys, go watch Hidden Figures. It was a new way of thinking about math. They use parabolic math to land the spaceship. Um, think about not just political people, but maybe people in a field that they're really um, interested in that is their role model um, that kind of solves problems a certain way. And maybe you also could create um, correspondence with that person. If this is a living document, I definitely think you could use it for self-advocacy of um, maybe presenting this profile to teachers of, hey, this is where I'm at. This is where I want to be. Um, what's your profile? How could you help me? And that way, it's more than just the student that's sitting in front of them. You get a little bit more knowledge. And I know that for myself as a gifted teacher, I feel like I have 
secret information because I have their cognitive information, but I think it would be helpful in that individualized plan to have this information as well, to know that in fifth grade, this is the things that really resonated with them. So do I have any questions? can't see in the Chris are there any hands up I can't tell but... apologies there is um hang on one sec um did you I had to turn off I'm sorry I had to uh turn off my camera and remove my headset did you answer the question in the chat yes Peter? I just did. Yes. okay um okay so oh. Oh, there is a hand. Erin. Okay. Erin, what's your question? No, you're fine. My computer is so slow. So it's like, so I'm trying to write a question, but it's like all over. Um, I am a yoga teacher as well as an overexcitable. I thought I was an overexcitable in reverse. So I'm always curious to see how, um, what kids are being offered for movement practices, because there is no differentiation between the intellect and motion and body and emo you know, all that. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of learning how to process the information, but also learn how to self-regulate and all, all that. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, so I, I don't know where I found it. It's on Teachers Pay Teachers somewhere. There's actually a language arts teacher that uses yoga to help students as they look through literature. Um, I know you do the tree pose when you think about setting um, and kind of those movement, those natural movements that you can do in the classroom. So they're not just sitting and getting that lecture style. Um, and I would also say that um, luckily I work at a gifted school. So I think it's a little bit different. Um, I think you could also use those characters from the books as models of self-regulation. Um, and also maybe use this as a tool with parents of, Hey mom, I noticed that you're very psychomotor. How do you regulate when you feel, or you modulate? How do you modulate? Um, like Dr. Coggin and Dr. Freed said, the living with intensities does have some great suggestions for ways to modulate. Um, I don't know necessarily that it's quite into general education yet. Um, and I would just say um, modeling, 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 because a lot of our gifted students are so intellectually asynchronous from their peers that a lot of times those human skills of, you know, this is how to bring yourself back. This is how to regulate back. Um, those skills have to be explicitly taught. So I would possibly ask the student to self-advocate for themselves, to ask a teacher or ask a counselor or ask their parents, um, hey mom, I've noticed this, how, how could I? Um, and, and I would physically show them. I wouldn't just tell them. Um, as somebody with ADHD, telling me to do the dishes means a lot of things. I, I need you to walk me through it. Um, model, model, model. Um, also model out loud how you think as you regulate um, would be big. Okay, see a question. Okay, I work in the animation and video game industry and work on creating characters every day. I was wondering if you have any insight in creating fictional characters with overexcited abilities in mind, perhaps creating characters with these students would resonate. Honestly, I think this would be a great exercise to have students do it. Um, think about um, video games. Your fight power is this, your living power is this. Think about those scales. And like Dr. Coggin said, is it a low intensity? Is it a medium intensity? Is it high? And think about a character that walks into a story with a high intensity and in psychomotor, low in sensory, um, and maybe medium in imaginational. How are they going to approach something compared to a different character? Um, I, I, I'm always big on building characters. Think about, um, I think it was the, that, that circle that we had on day one or day two. And think about the things that are your truths, your past experiences. I don't want to necessarily say traumas, but your, your memories of how you exist. I would suggest that as how you build characters. Think about not just the character in the moment, but the character through time. Chris, I think, oh, okay, you're welcome. Any questions? I'm gonna stop the recording. Thanks so much, Jess. I mean, maybe I, if there are no other questions, let's just.